do you get when two musical legends collide? Pop music perfection, of course. George Benson, meet Quincy Jones. Released in 1980, Benson's Give Me the Night album, produced by Jones, would be a hallmark record. The first release by Q's Quest Records label, the album would be a mix of R&B, jazz, Brazilian, and straight up dance music that would make George Benson a household name. Number three on the Billboard 200, number one R&B, certified platinum in four countries. This was a big record with a big hit on it. The bass on this track is a two-headed monster. Depending on the section, we're either hearing keyboard bass or bass guitar. The verses and the choruses are driven by a synth bass line. And that line was played by one of the unsung keyboardists of the 20th century, the late, great Richard T. Whether it was organ, piano, or synthesizer, Richard T. was one of the most sought-after studio musicians for over 25 years. A small list of some of his collaborators includes Paul Simon, Roberta Flack, Billy Joel, James Brown, and Aretha Franklin. Look him up. Now, when that bridge kicks in, the bass guitar takes over the line. So come on out tonight, and we'll leave the others on a Legendary engineer Bruce Sweden EQ'd the bass sound really dark so that it could match the keyboard sound in the mix. It ends up giving us a really subtle difference in feel between this section and the chorus. And check out that horn line. This part of the bass line was played by the legendary Abe Laboriel, who at this point had already made records with Al Jarreau, Herb Albert, Stan Getz, and Dolly Parton. He tunes down that low E string on the bass to an E flat to facilitate the low notes in the key of F minor for this song. This was a common practice among studio bassists before the five and six string basses became standard. Anthony Jackson, Marcus Miller, Nathan East, all tuned down depending on the notes they needed. Abe is also using his thumb to get a pointed and bouncy sound. Oh yeah, in that dope bass note, it happens right after the breakdown. What? That note has always just slayed me. Firstly, it's tuned down to an E flat. Also, the fact that it's an open string makes it just chime. Add to that, he's hitting it really hard and it's coming in after a section with no bass. It's just well-placed and it punches you right in the chest. And if you listen really closely, you can hear Abe play the first two measures of the chorus before the synth bass takes over again. This makes the transition a little more seamless between the two instruments. So why in the world would Quincy do this? Why two bass parts? Q famously liked to record many different tracks with many different players. He would then fade parts in and out to see what worked best. Steely Dan also did this. What it ends up giving the producer is an incredibly wide sonic palette to work with. I'm guessing Richard T. and Abe Laboriel both played full takes on the recording, and Q used them both at different parts in the song. As you might think, this style of recording was often very expensive and very time-consuming, but I think we can say the end 
justifies the means when it comes to making great music. Two great performances on one great track and one epic bass note. Check it out.